Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, church this morning. Um, we are delighted to have uh, Sharon Hindle lead us in service today. She is a former chaplain of Robert Wood Johnson Hospital and um, um, let's get our minds into um, worship and um, happy Sunday. Call to worship. Lord Jesus Christ, on the second Sunday of Easter, the light of your love shines on. And we, like Mary, like the disciples, and like Downey Thomas, who have been there with you through Holy Week and the first Easter morning, have been made witnesses to the resurrection story. Wondering, bewildering, hoping, rejoicing, and sometimes doubting. <coughs> Our hymn of praise is, Lord, speak to me that I may speak. Number 754 in your hymn.
Please join me in the prayer of confession. Lord, our God, we confess that we do not always accept the new growth within us. Often we fail to see the beauty in this world of ours. Seldom do we recognize the love that is offered to us each day. We become too busy with our own tasks and do not bother to see if they fit into your plans for us. Amid change, we become tentative and fearful, finding it difficult to trust in your upholding presence. We pray that the reality of the resurrection may bring us new life and new meaning to our living. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. that you may trust, words that merit full acceptance. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. To all who confess their sins and now resolve to lead a new life, he says, your sins are forgiven. He also says, follow me. Now to the one who rules all the worlds, immortal, invisible, the only God to honor and glory forever and ever. Our first reading is Psalm 118, verses 14 to 19, and it's page 492 in the Pew Bibles. My Lord is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. There are glad songs of victory in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. 
The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live, and recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has punished me severely, but he did not give me over to death. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them, and give thanks to the Lord. And our second reading is from John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31, and it's page 883 in the Pew Bibles. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was also called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of his nails, of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the, the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now the Lord did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. So one of the complications I had this morning was my printer decided to not work. So we're going to come into that 20th century, 21st century, and hope my iPad um, cooperates. So good morning. Um, grace and peace to all of you. I'm so grateful that you came this morning. Um, I have not met many of you before, so I will share a little bit about my own path. Um, as I began my ministry, I began at Hunterdon Medical Center um, and uh, was blessed to have a mentor there. Um, he retired and then I went to um, work for or work with uh, the new chaplain there and he inquired why I hadn't become uh, credentialed to be a chaplain. And as they say, the rest is history. In 2002, I began my clinical training at Robert Wood while I was still volunteering at Pemberton, and then I was actually called to the first full-time ministry there um, as the oncology chaplain. And it was a wonderful time to be able to create this new position to care for not only the families and the patients, but also the staff. I served once hired supporting the staff and patients for 11 years, and my experiences surely brought many questions and much time to reflect in prayer. There were times when I would steal away to the chapel for time to seek guidance and direction. I was at Robert Wood when I actually met Pastor Liz. She was there doing her clinicals right when I was retiring, and we actually have uh, mutual clergy colleagues. So I'm honored to be here today, and if any of you have friends who are Greek Orthodox, today is Orthodox Easter for our Greek brothers and sisters. And they would say, Christos Sanesti, which is Christ is risen. And the reply is, Alethios Sanesti, indeed he has risen. In today's scriptures, 
we read, we heard, and may reflect on tremendous emotions. In the Psalms, we hear great elation and exaltation and great joy and victory for this day, and we are glad in it. One, there was one tremendous celebration for sure, all rejoicing for the one whose love endures forever. Wow, truly what feels to be the pinnacle of elation, I might then also assume that everyone now felt right and safe. I would have been so relieved, and I can imagine they were also. Can you imagine living in that period of time and believing now that your soul is secure and your life would be better now believing that Jesus had died and been resurrected? Indeed, we do send thanks to God, and then the elation fades, and more emotions pour through, and reality begins to set in. Now what? What just does this all mean? What does it mean? What do we think, and what do we believe? As we move into the texts in John, again, more emotion. We are told the disciples are overjoyed, and poor Thomas is in disbelief. As I began to prepare this morning, I kept thinking to myself that such a big emotion was not being yet addressed. And remember what I did for a living, and still do very often, is I realized that no one was talking about their grief. In those early days of those scripture times, <coughs> There was very little time for mourning. Life was very short for very many reasons. In our modern culture, we are told how we are going to mourn. We are told how we're going to grieve and the timeline for it all. As we move into grieving, it takes time for us to absorb what this loss means to us. So what did it mean for Jesus? to not be in that tomb. The texts this morning don't help us understand this until Thomas speaks up. Poor Thomas, historically he's criticized for criticize, I mean, for questioning Jesus' resurrection and return. Much like our modern culture, we can move forward knowing that a major event may have taken our life to a better place. Or maybe if it was a negative event, that we were fortunate it didn't personally affect us. I see Thomas as asking us to pause, to ask, is this what I hope to be true? Is this actually true? Is this true, actually? And what does this mean for me? And what does this mean for us? How often have we said or heard someone say, I'll believe it when I see it. And there was Thomas asking to be reassured because this wondrous, important thing that happened, he really wanted to be reassured that it was in fact true. So at this point, we have elation, we have joy, we have doubt. And here I am as a chaplain thinking that there must have been tremendous grief underpinning the death of Jesus. The tomb was empty, so now what? Can you put yourself back then? Can you imagine being there? My heart would have been sunken. I would have crumbled with grief. I would have been terrified that the man who had led us is now dead and missing. How often in our modern times do we jump to those good parts? In social media, it is the thing. Remember the fast forward button on the VCR? I think I'm old enough to remember that. Skip over, just go to the good part. Working with many cultures and faith traditions as I did, I was gifted perspectives that I otherwise would not have had about how different cultures and faith traditions process grief. And yes, I worked with grief as a common theme. There were also great highlights of healing and 
physical and spiritual as well. Our modern culture has conditioned us to look for those good parts. When things are good, we shouldn't ask why. We should only be grateful. When we have doubts and questions, we're discouraged to speak up. We're told again, just be grateful. Thomas brings so much to this story that also seems to just blindly dismiss him for asking for reassurance. Thomas brings me to pause to consider this bigger picture for not only what is in front of mine, but others' eyes. He asks for reassurances that what he so desperately wants to be true is in fact true. So when Thomas says, unless I see, I do not hear a rigid disbeliever. I hear a grieving and hopeful man. Thomas is desperately wants this to be true, and to me, it is only immediate, he is immediately glazing over the facts of the suffering and the loss of Jesus to everyone. I feel despair as it becomes a crescendo. I'd like to share a story about one of my patients. He's been very open about his journey, and I would not share any information that was out with his permission. Also know that this story will get a little sad, and might even get a little scary, but I want you to know I would never tell a story here that did not have a happy ending, so it's okay. It was my habit to visit every new patient as they got admitted, because normally they would be admitted for a period of days. It was not a simple thing to be treated um, in our units. So, I went to visit one of those new patients, and this morning I will name him Alex. Alex was 35 at the time. His mother was visiting him from another country, and this was important because she would bring their home food to share with us. She was building a community around her son, filling us with delicious ethnic homemade food. She was building that community so that we would all feel invested to care for her son, which she didn't know is that of course we would have, but that food, I have to tell you, you could smell it coming down the hall. Alex also had a long-term girlfriend and when I first met Alex, he told me he was not a religious man. So thanks, but no thanks, chaplain. That is what I heard. As the days progressed, I would stop by his door, and I would wave, and I would say hello, and I would keep on going. One day, he was walking the halls with his IV pole in tow. He was a runner, and he had his five-finger shoes, and he was making laps trying to stay as physically active as he could. So I walked with him, and he turned to me, and he asked me, Chaplain, what is it that you believe about God? Well, it's in my training to never talk about what I believe, but help someone discover what they believe. But something told me to be honest, and so I did. <coughs> he remarked that he liked what I thought, and I knew in those moments that he must have gained trust. As he went in and out of treatment, I admit I always looked forward to seeing Alex and his girlfriend and, of course, his mother and her amazing food. It's very different from congregational ministry. I was always the happiest when I didn't see patients return. In congregational ministry, we're always very happy when we see your faces, when we haven't seen you for a while. So it's kind of an oxymoron to think I would be happy to not see my patients. But I do sometimes follow and see that they're well. Well, one day, I was called by the RM. <coughs> Apparently, Alex received devastating news. He needed a bone marrow transplant, and there were no donors. This was life-ending news, and so I sat on the bed with him, and we wept. This was the most terrible potential outcome, and it was possibly coming true. So if we go back to Thomas, this terrible outcome could have had the most glorious ending, but he needed to be reassured that it was true. This patient, he, he was not going to see that resurrection yet. So, 
we do not know when that day comes for any of us. And so Alex and his mother and his girlfriend and myself and his friends and the rest of his family began a journey of what we call anticipatory grief because we didn't know what was going to happen. That's where Thomas was. He was anticipating grief once he was assured that Jesus had actually died, that he wasn't only missing, and that in fact he had been resurrected. So as we go back to those days post-resurrection, again, I note there was very little grieving. There was no pausing to reflect. It was just taken for granted that everything was now gonna be all right, as promised, even though now Jesus was dead. No one had ever died and returned before. Remember, this is a story we know, but to them it hadn't yet been written. No one had ever died and re returned before. They had no context. They had no experience. They just jumped to the good part. They deemed it to be true. They begged for it to be true. Well, along comes Thomas, who effectively is the sling. Hold up a minute, y'all. I know this good news. I want it to be true, but I just can't go along with you. I need reassurance. And what happens next, I see, is a tremendous bucket of grace. Jesus doesn't scoff nor shame Thomas for his doubt. What does he say? Put yourself in Thomas's shoes. There he is knowing Jesus has died. The tomb is empty and now what? And remember, the story was not yet written. During my training, we had to complete something called a grief graph. Now, of course, on this graph, I put on my grandparents who had died, and then my dad, my choir director, my dog. But then I started adding other losses. I added lost major relationships, homes I moved from, friends who died, hopes unfulfilled, and grief began to pour into this document. I added all these things that I came to realize were also part of grief. I came to know that grief does not always follow a life lost. It may be a grief for a life you knew that is now different. The feelings may begin as a lament and go all the way to grief. Take one moment to consider a loss you might grieve that wasn't a pet or a person. Regardless, these moments of realizing the story you wrote has been changed with an addendum or maybe an erased paragraph. At least, something that mattered to you didn't turn out the way you had hoped for. Okay, so now we're gonna go back to Alex. His grief began when he lost the innocence of his good health. His grief moved across the lost dreams with his girlfriend. He was young and there was so much to grieve. And like Thomas, Alex was being asked to do this and he asked himself, what does this actually mean? Well, remember I said the story would get happy? Well, now easily 10 years later, Alex received at the time an experimental bone marrow transplant in New York. He is wonderfully living. He's back to running and cycling. He's married to that beautiful woman that stood by him in his illness, and they've got two beautiful daughters. He is still living with his grief of his future as he wrote it. Like Thomas, I suggest we need to sit with these tremendous shifts in our life and allow ourselves to grieve for what we hope to not turn out to be true and what we hope to turn out to be true. The job, the child, the friend, the marriage, anything we lose, some are small and others are not. But I do hope that if we take time to recognize the importance of something or someone that's lost to us, that we have much more room to rejoice. If we, like Thomas, pause and ask what this means to me and to others, admit that we are scared and we need reassurance. We make room to honor the grief, to make room for once again we are able to jump to those good parts.
If you would please join me in the confession of faith that is printed in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us all join one another's hearts in a prayer. Gracious God, coming before you reminds us that we are vulnerable. But in those vulnerabilities, oh God, we also recognize that because of the empty tomb and because of the reassurances that you have given us and give us daily, we can move through this broken world of ours. Oh God, this morning we have heard tremendous movement, movement of small healings. We've heard gratitude. We've heard memory. Oh God, you walk with us every day. And for this, being able to turn our faces to you, oh God, in these prayers, for each of these people, in all the prayers, oh God, that were not said aloud, you still hear our prayers. And for this, we lift gratitude to you, O oh God. Amen. So now, would you join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
So please join us. Great village. making us eager to obey the will of God until we meet again through our Lord Jesus Christ. Go in grace, go in peace.